Good morning, First Church. We are so very glad that you all are here to worship the most amazing God ever in this place today. Thanks for joining us. If this is your first time here, we want to welcome you. We are so glad that you are here at FCC today. Um, if you need a communion element and you didn't get one, you can raise your hand at any time and someone can bring one to you or there is usually a basket on either side of the auditorium down here as well. To begin service off today, Chad Wolf is going to read scripture for us and he is already up here. So if you would, let's all go ahead and stand in reverence to God today and let's set our minds in on what um, he wants to tell us this morning. Good morning. Uh, so I'm going to start off with uh, Psalm 141. Uh, it says, uh, Oh Lord, I call to you. Come quickly to me. Hear my voice when I call you. May my prayer be set before you like, like incense. May the lifting up my hands be like the evening sacrifice. I'm going to jump to uh, ch uh, verse 5, and it says, Let a righteous man strike me. It is kindness. Let him rebuke me. It is oil on my head. My head will not refuse it. Um, this week I've been in, engulfed in a whole lot of comfort, right? And uh, Devin um, gave us a great question in the chopper time. I'm one of the three people that listen to it. Um, so, but it's, uh, um, he asked, uh, when does our comfort become our um, idolatry? And it's a really, really good question. When does our comfort become idolatry? And it's a hard question, but really, if we let our comfort stop us from pursuing God, that's idolatry. So if our comfort is sitting in the same exact pew every week, because that's where we like it, that's where we feel comfortable, the people around us don't ask the hard questions, maybe the person next to us, you know, doesn't really pr push us to uh, pursue, um, I mean, that could be an idolatry. If, uh, if your hands are more comfortable in your pockets because God's calling you to raise them and you're like, no, 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 they're just more warm in my pockets, that could become idolatry. My wife, um, wrote me on Monday and she goes, hey, we need to go down to Asbury. And it's really weird because my wife is a inverted person. She likes, she doesn't like a thousand people, you know. She doesn't want to necessarily be in that type of atmosphere. But she's like, let's go. And I'm like, yeah, let's go. So we went down. And in her uh, way of coming out of her comfort, I got to experience God in such a great way. Like, he comforted me. You know, I, I wept in his presence, and it's, it, it was just this amazing time because my wife stepped out of her comfort zone. And I just, I just want to make sure that everybody in here, if you're comfortable somewhere, give it up to God. Let him pull you out of that comfort zone, whether that be at home, whether that be here in church, whether that be wherever. Let God call you out of that because just like Ben was saying, you know, we might be more comfortable in captivity in captivity, guys, and I mean that goes everywhere. Let yourself be free with God. Let us call, let Him call you out, and in, in, in this time of worship and today, I'll, I'll pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for bringing us here, Lord. I just pray that uh, you call us out of our comfort zones. You you uh, shine light in our hearts and just uh, let us have the courage to uh, follow you, Lord. Uh, no matter how that may be, no matter how uncomfortable we may feel, I just pray that uh, we can do that and we have that courage. Lord, let us stand firm in you and our faith. Let us uh, really just pursue you and your heart and let us share it with others. Let me pray.
thank him for his greatness today.
wronged and broken for my regard. Sing out in faith today. pray together. God, I, 
I really don't have the words to say other than I'm just so thankful to be in your presence. And I don't understand how we get to be in commune with a king, with our God. And I just thank you for, for being with us in every second of our lives, even when we don't feel it. We know you're there, God. And thank you for, for guiding us in, in the big waves, for the times where we're just smooth sailing. Just thank you for being there through it all. God, help us look to you in everything that we do and always run everything by you, God. And realize that you are the Lord of our lives and that we can have so much more peace and joy and hope in this life if we can just look to you and trust in your plan. And God, I'm saying that for myself as much as I am for all of us here today. We love you, God. We lay our lives down before you, God. Please use us. I don't know why you use people like us, God, but we're thankful that you do. Thank you for never giving up on us, for giving us second chances, and for saving us and continuing to sanctify us and transforming our lives. God, help us look more like Jesus in everything we, that we do. We love you, and we are just so glad that we can be here in this place, God, and praise you. You deserve it all. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. You know, sometimes the Holy Spirit leads us to speak about a topic that might be heavy on our heart. Earlier this week, I had prepared a communion message for today, and about midweek, I decided I wanted to speak to you about something very different. We know that the whole world needs Jesus. Jesus tells that tells us this over and over again in Scripture. In Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, he gave us the words of the Great Commission. And this is what it says. So go and make followers of all people in the world. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that I've told you to do you can be sure that I will be with you until the end of time. So our assignment according to the Great Commission is to go. And it isn't a suggestion, and it isn't optional. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, God expects you and he expects me to go. It's why it's called the Great Commission and not the Great Suggestion. Our duty is to go and make disciples. People who will love and follow Jesus and his teachings and do the five things that we were put on earth to do. We were put on earth to know and follow Jesus faithfully every day of our lives. To grow in spiritual maturity so that we can better understand God's teachings. To worship our Savior with all of our heart. To serve him through ministry, both those people who are saved and those that are unsaved. And to share the good news of Jesus Christ. You know, as I was doing a little bit of research for the uh, communion thought today, I was looking up information about the, the Great Commission. And I found a statistic that I thought was pretty surprising. And this is what the statistic said. That of the believers in churches in the United States, 51% of those people who sit in church pews don't know what the Great Commission is. It's pretty shocking. Jesus is our authority in this matter. He's our authority in the Great Commission. 
and our responsibility, this is our responsibility, is to make disciples, Jesus followers, Jesus lovers, wherever we are planted, whether it's in a far off country or if we speak to our neighbor next door, our coworkers, people that we encounter at the supermarket, can be any place. We, are, we can and we're told by Jesus to be active, to be active in our faith so that we can lead others to come to Christ and to know him like we do. Where we fail at times is not taking advantage of the opportunities that we're given to share his holy word. Maybe that's because we're uncomfortable with the notion of, of speaking about spirituality with other people. And maybe we're fearful that we're going to be rejected by those people that we approach. But if he is who we say that he is, and we believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life, then we shouldn't be fearful to ever proclaim his holiness, his authority, his power, and his mercy to those who may not know him. I taught 38 years at KCU, and I've got a lot of wonderful memories of my Christian mentors while I was there. And they taught me the importance of investing myself in the Great Commission, both far away and here. Folks like Dr. Lowell Lusby, Dr. Donald Nash, Dr. Dick Dameron, Dr. Charles Gresham, Mr. Tom Gemeinhart, Laverne Carnes, Alice Morgan, Dr. Jim Girdwood, Dr. Rob Ford, and my sweetheart, Jackie Grant. Many have gone home to be with their Lord, but all would be quick to tell you how important it is to invest yourself in furthering God's kingdom and to win those who don't know Christ to his kingdom. I want you to imagine this, because <laughs> there's such a thing as, it's kind of called a, a Christianity multiplier. But imagine this. What if one believer decides to lead one person to Christ every year? Disciple the new believer. And that needs to be added if you're going to encounter the Great Commission. Disciple that new believer and train them how to do the same with someone else. After one year, there would be two disciples. At the end of the second year, there'd be four. Third year, there would be eight followers of Jesus. Fourth year, 16. But by year 33, there would be over eight and a half billion Christian followers. That's pretty staggering. Our thoughts today should be centered around Jesus and in Jesus and what we can do for Jesus and his kingdom. We know, we know that Jesus paid it all and that we owe him everything, everything to him. We were stained with sin and Jesus took it upon himself to be sacrificed in our behalf and to wash those sins away. Um, I'd like for you, if you would, to get your emblems out and let's prepare to take communion together. Thank you, Lord, for loving us so much that you willingly gave your life for the atonement of our sins. Thank you, Jesus, for the shedding of your blood to create a path for eternal life with you and our Father.
Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for this opportunity to be in your house, to be with fellow believers, to worship you. And I pray as our week unfolds that we're given opportunities to reach out and touch other lives. It can be as simple as being in the, in the grocery store and encountering someone that, that just needs to be encouraged and, and maybe to have someone pray over them. Father, I, I, I pray that we're given those opportunities often and that we take the time that might be necessary to help someone know who Jesus Christ is and that he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. morning. Chad, I want you to know how uncomfortable I am. Um, I'm glad my wife's not here this morning to hear this illustration I'm going to make because she'll probably crawl under her pew. But picture this. You're, you're walking into your yard on a, on a hot summer day and you feel something under your foot. And just that combination of a slip and a squish and the smell that you've unleashed, it goes from the ground to your nose at the speed of light. And that, that substance that you stepped in, there are more, there's more than one word you can use for that. Some are more morally and socially acceptable than others. And the words that come out of your mouth in that moment there's a lot you could use, and some are more morally and socially acceptable than others. Uh, in youth group a few weeks back, Thomas and the small group leaders, we tackled the question of, is, it, is cussing a sin? And my sc small group was high school boys, and I think historically speaking, that's a group that struggles with good word choice. But we settled on the idea that we should not be deceived into thinking we've achieved some great holiness just because we don't use four-letter words. But God blessed us with the ability to speak so our words matter. The, wor the words that we choose, the way we speak to people, the way we speak about people, and even the tone we use, those things matter to God. And how well we do them it will reveal how much of a priority God is in our life. God's also blessed us with time, and he's blessed us with talents, even if we can't name what those talents are. And he's blessed us with varying levels of earthly possessions. And how well we use them will reveal a lot about what kind of priorities we set for God in our life. Um, there's nothing great about a, a rich man giving with a heart of stinginess from his excess. And there's nothing great about a poor man crying out for a, some higher power to take the rich man's wealth and, and redistribute it. But there is something great about God's people using the time and the talents and the material gifts he's given us and investing them in things that have eternal value. When we do those things, how well we do that, those things will reveal how much, we, how much of a priority God is in our life. Matthew 6, starting in chapter, in verse 19, says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
you'd like to give financially to the church, to God's church here, there are collection boxes out in the lobby, or you can mail in your your checks. Or if you're a hipster and don't believe in cash and checks, I'm sure the other methods are listed on the screen here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, for your blessings. We thank you for your, for your word and your promises. Lord, just help us to discern um, things that matter to you in this world and, and things that are worthless, things that are folly, Lord, and, and just help us to uh, focus on things that, that matter to you and things that have eternal value. We love you, Lord, and we think we just pray that uh, you would guide us in, in the use of these gifts and that we use, may use them to, to further your kingdom. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hello, First Church. If you're, uh, if you're new here with us, you're visiting for the first time, my name is uh, Ben James. I'm the lead pastor here. Uh, thank you for being with us. We, we truly do count it a, an honor and a privilege to have you here to uh, be with us as we glorify the Lord, as we lift up His name, and we want to do so right now in His Word as we, uh, as we examine the Scripture. We're in our fourth week in the book of Hebrews, and we're going to be talking about pay close attention. Now, there is a temptation for me to title every sermon that I preach, pay close attention. But this one comes directly from our scripture. But I want to ask you, before we read, I want to ask you a question. Has anybody, um, have you ever like enjoyed like a lazy river kind of thing? Like the lazy river, you know what I'm talking about? Like just, you know, you're, you're somewhere tropical or not Appalachia, and uh, you know, you, you, you get in this, this pool that's got a little stream there, and you just kind of float along in life. That's nice, isn't it? Like, you know, typically it's designed for us to kind of detach and just relax, and boy, wouldn't life be good if that was the case, if we had time for just this lazy river experience as we're going through. And I was thinking about, as I was thinking about lazy rivers and how, you know, life is everything but a lazy river. I was thinking about a story from, uh, well, back in my teenage years. I'll make this as brief as possible, but my friends and I had decided that we needed to go on like a uh, canoe race. We put in at Carter Caves, Tiger Creek, and we were going to race all the way to Iron Hill. I'm sorry, forgive me, locals. Iron Hill. Uh, <laughs> So we were going to race all the way to Arn Hill. And we had, my buddy and I started at the very back of the pack. And I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not going to mention any names or anything as to who he was, uh, but we were not considered the most graceful of our friend group, nor were we the lightest out of the friend group either. But we started in the back, and all of a sudden, we're just passing people like crazy. And we don't know what's going on. And then we finally kind of figured out. I was like, hey, we're, we're taking more chances in the current. You know, like in the way that the water's flowing, we are taking more chances and going over more areas than what most people are. They're, they're kind of hitting. And, you know, if there's a tree or whatever in the way, they're, if it's too shallow in their estimation, they're getting out there. They're carrying, you know, their boats. And we're just zooming by them. So we get like into this second place position and we're getting really close to the finish line so it's like all you know it's like green flag racing full on at this point and we're coming to this place in tiger and we see this tree that's down over the creek and we see the people in front of us like get out and pick up their boat lift it over, try to get back in. We know this is our time to make up ground. So I tell my buddy, I'm in the front of the boat. He's in the back of the boat. I was like, we're not doing that. We're going under it. All right, so get ready. All right, so here's the plan. I mean, it, it was like full on, I'm like figuring things out and doing math and all of that stuff. And I was like, here's how we're going to approach it. When we get close to it, I'm going to lay as far back as I possibly can. And then when I clear it, once I get under it, I'm going to set up and I'm going to start paddling. Now you, I need you to paddle this whole time that I'm not paddling. 
Okay? All right. So we get there. I quit paddling. I lean back, and man, I go underneath this tree, and it's just like, I mean, I can almost feel it touching my nose. Okay? So, but I clear it. I get under it. And the plan was still in place. I pop up, just start going to town, and then all of a sudden the boat just goes and stops. And I'm like, what's going on? And all I can hear from the back of the boat is, and I'm like, let's go. We're gaining on. And finally I get so frustrated, I turn around, and the tree had my buddy's chin hooked right here, and his neck is just craned back, and I'm like, and he's trying to get my attention, and we didn't win. Uh, <laughs> so I look back, I paddle back, I was like, lay your head to the side. If your chin is that big, get it over to the side. I don't know if there was a point to that story or not, I just really wanted to tell it. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's, it really, I mean, we kind of got this power of, of the current of life sometimes, you know, just like, Things come against us, and I don't know if you've ever been uh, in, in a place. How, how many of you have visited, like, the ocean at, at any point? Any, any, any ocean? Yeah. So I remember when Rachel was younger, Kim would set us down. <laughs> she was saying she wanted to instruct Rachel on safety, but I was included. <laughs> she was looking at me more than she was Rachel. <laughs> she was like, now, when you go out into the water, this is what our umbrella looks like. Make sure you look up every now and then. That way you can see where the umbrella is. You all know why, why you do that? Because there's a natural drift that takes place, right, in the current. And if you're not paying attention to where you are in that landmark, you're going to wind up all the way miles, could possibly be miles away from where you started. And just newsflash, there's sharks in the ocean, people. Okay? And if you don't believe me, get out to about waist deep, let a piece of seaweed hit your ankle, you're going to see how quick you are. And I don't recommend watching Shark Week the week before you go to, to the beach. But anyhow, I want, us to, I want us to look this morning at the first four verses of Hebrews chapter 2. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 2, and we're going to be reading the first four verses. So, the first word is therefore. Now, we, you probably heard it. If not, anytime you come to Scripture and you find the word therefore, you ask, what's it there for? What's it there for? Go back to verse, you know, to very first verse in chapter 1 of Hebrews 1 and 2. Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers through the prophets, but in these last days He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world, that he sustains the world, that he's redeemed us from our sins, and now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. So then he goes on into this, talking about Jesus is greater than the angels, than our comfort, than our idols, than things that we could possibly try to look at whenever we get into that, that, that current of life, and it just seems to be pulling us so hard against our chin and the log, you know? It's like we have no control over what's happening. Therefore, remember that Jesus Christ is greater than anything that's happening in your life. Then he goes on to say this. This is the first out of five or six, according to how you interpret it, but this is the first warning that we find in the book of Hebrews. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. I want to introduce a thought to you here really quickly. Your faith is a fight. Our faith is a fight. 
And I want us to look really quickly at the book of 1 Timothy. We've got a couple slides up here for it. Austin, you'll need to go ahead a couple, please. One more. There we go. 1 Timothy Timothy 6, verse 12, says, Fight the good fight of faith. Our faith is a fight. 20 and 21, O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and the contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. We have to fight for our faith because everything, almost everything in this life is going to serve to try to pull us away from our faith in Jesus Christ. And I know I'm not the only one in here who's experienced that on a day-in, day-out basis. Seemingly, the devil will throw anything and everything he possibly can at you in order to attack your faith and get you to questioning what you truly believe. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is warning us against here. Do not waver. Do not drift. Pay close attention. Timothy, Paul is writing to Timothy saying, fight for your faith. Don't let all this babble. Don't let all this confusion. Don't let all this nonsense take you away from the message that was preached to you. In Revelation chapter 2, we see the church at Ephesus God is, uh, you know, giving this revelation to John while he's on the Isle of Patmos. And he's saying that these wonderful things that you're doing, you're doing great works. You're not, you're, you're, you're not tolerating uh, doctrine and teaching that isn't sound. You're not falling into the trap of the Nicolaitans. You're not doing all of these things. You're doing great works. But I have this against you, that you have fallen away from your first love. The things you did at first, the love that you had for God and the love that you had for each other. I don't care how good of a works that you're doing. No matter what type of standard that you have for good, sound doctrine being in your midst, you have neglected that thing which you did at first, and that was the love that you had for God and the love that you had for other people. Because that's kind of the temptation Right? That's what the enemy wants us to do. We talked about in the very first message of this study that if he can't keep you from giving your heart and your life to Jesus Christ, then he's going to do everything he can to keep your attention from being focused completely on him. And he does that through distractions. We saw last week where he could possibly even do that through good things, through God things, through blessings that he's given us. You know what a couple of the things that I think are are sometimes the ones that keep us from focusing on Christ the way we need to, the things that cause our attention to sway and our focus to be off of him and for us to begin to drift, a couple of things that I can think of are some really good things that God blesses us with. How about our families? The truth of the matter this morning is, is you need to love God more than you love your family. You need to prioritize your relationship with him more than you prioritize your family. Now, the beautiful thing about God is that if we keep him in focus and prioritize him at the first, then our family is going to be far more healthy than what it ever would be if we were trying to elevate it first. You place God at the top, I promise you, my friends, that everything in your life will be as healthy as it could possibly be. Not that it's going to be easy. Not that it's going to be without difficult, without pain, without loss, without grief, without sorrow, but I'll promise you one thing, that if you elevate God first in your life and you focus on him and you do not drift from seeking Jesus Christ first in everything, all of these other things will be as healthy as they could be. It's almost like Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, 33, when he's talking about the kingdom of God is not in meat or drink, but in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on to say that seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. How easy is that for us to do, though? Another area, what about our job? 
What about our career? What about that thing that we've dedicated ourselves to so much to provide for our family? That's a great thing that God gives us the means to provide, amen? It's a great thing. But if we elevate that and our focus and our energy and our time and our efforts on that more than what we do our relationship with God, then we've began to drift. We're losing our sight. We're losing our focus. And later in this, in this passage that we just read, we see the, um, the, the message, okay? We see from Luke chapter 4, because we talk about, you know, the writer talks about the message that the angels have spoken, that has been given to us, that's been tried and tested. And we see in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21, I don't know if I did a slide for this. Let me go to a novel concept. Let me look in my Bible. It's okay. You can laugh. It's funny. It's all right. Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. That's the message. The one that Jesus Christ set and said as rolling out the scroll, reading from the book of Isaiah, the prophet, saying that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Anything that serves to pull you away from the truth of that foundational message, anything that serves to take your focus from that message is causing you to drift. And this is the big problem that the the Hebrew people, the people who had converted, the Jews that had accepted Jesus in their lives, that was the big problem that they were facing was they were drifting away from their faith in Jesus Christ. Whatever the means, whatever, it, it, whatever was happening, they began to sacrifice. They began to compromise. They began to hold hold uh, just a little bit more loosely to the truth of this message of Jesus Christ and what they did and what they had been. And at that point, you know, to quote the the great philosophers, if you hold on loosely and don't let go, because if you cling too tightly, you're going to lose control. I'm sorry, I don't agree with 38 special on that one in regards to the truth of Jesus' message. We must cling to the truth of the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ coming and setting the captive free. Because if we begin to loosen our grip on that truth, on that reality, and we start losing our focus, then we begin to drift. We've taken our eyes off that umbrella that my wife was so passionately looking going, and what, what, what are we going to look for again? Again, to me, not Rachel. <laughs> what are we going to look for again? Whenever we allow our face to be pulled away and our focus to be pulled off of him, then we begin to drift and our faith becomes compromised. Now, I'm, just, I'm going to be real honest with you. I'm just going to, to, to mind the Lord and what he's put on my heart uh, since last night into this morning. So, Austin, if you want to, just go back to that first slide. Um, we're, we're not going to have anything that follows that. But I want to ask you this question today. Are you tired? Are you tired? Now, I see some of you trying to take a nap in my message, so I know that you're you're, you're tired that way. I get it. But I'm not talking about I didn't get 
eight good hours last night. I'm not talking about the fact of, you know, I've got so much going on in my life, I can't sleep. I'm not talking about the, the tired that comes from lack of sleep. I'm talking about how many of you are just tired? Like so much is coming against you. Like it's wave after wave after wave after wave, and I can't seem to catch a break, preacher. I am just tired. I know I am. And I believe that so strongly within me that that's one of the things that the enemy does to us that get our focus off of Jesus Christ. Just wears us down with life. Like we can't explain it, right? Like we don't know what's coming up in the next day. We know what we're facing currently and we're just praying to God that nothing else happens because I'm already on the edge. I, I'm, you know, that, that breakdown, breakthrough thing, I know there's only one difference in the, in the words, but I'm telling you this breakdown is feeling a whole lot more realistic than this breakthrough in my life. Anybody? I'm tired. And I look at how God works in our lives and through us and even in these moments we see a reality of God's strength and God's focus needing to be evident in our lives in the book of Matthew chapter 14 I want to read something to us and just really quickly want to talk to us about this story verse 22 out of Matthew chapter 14, it says, Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. At any time in our lives, do you ever feel like the wind is against you? Like the waves are beating the boat, like life is just beating you down, and the winds of life are just set totally and completely against you. Then it says in verse 25, And in the fourth watch of the night he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And one of the things that's dawned on me in the past 12 hours as, I, as the Lord led me to that scripture, because I've, I've, I've preached it, I've listened to it, I've, I've had people teach it to me, I've read commentaries on it. Uh, we talk about Peter, you know, eventually sinking because the wind and the waves g grab his attention and his focus. But one of the things I never considered was the possibility of just how tired the disciples had to have been at this point. Because if you look back in the events that led up to this very moment, not only will you find the feeding of the 5,000, but before that, John the Baptist was beheaded. So here you have this group of believers. Now, they weren't disciples of John the Baptist, but they would have cared deeply for this man because this was a brother in the faith. And they would have had to be completely deflated and exhausted at the news that John the Baptist had been beheaded and, one, and someone had been martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. And then Jesus just wants to be alone. But what happens? All of a sudden, a great multitude follows him. The disciples are going, we need to shoo him away. All right, we're reeling, we're grieving, we're full of sorrow, we're full of pain over what happened to John the Baptist. Jesus, we need to tell him to go home. They're getting hungry and they don't have any food. He's like, you got some food. Give it to them. So the, the miracle of the feeding of the multitudes, and again, remember, 5,000 at this point in time in culture, it was just counting the men that were there. So you could probably say 15,000 at most conservative estimates, probably more around the 20,000 plus is how many were fed that day. And who did Jesus tell, go distribute the food to them? Whose responsibility was that? The disciples. So they went and they passed out all the food in the middle of the day. So it had to be something that was absolutely exhausting to them. And then the crowds consumed the food. Then they left. Then guess what had to happen? There was food left over. 
Guess who got to go gather it? The disciples. So they go and they gather all the food. Again, they're working, they're exhausted, they're tired. And then Jesus, you know, the natural thing that we would think is like, oh, Jesus is leading me to take a nap. Jesus is leading me into rest. That's not what happens. And sometimes, just side note, I think sometimes we, uh, we think Jesus is far nicer to us than what he actually is. Let me, let me qualify that statement here just a little bit, all right, because I don't want to confuse anybody. Jesus is a nice guy, okay? All right. But he's not always as nice and just like, oh, I get it. I understand. He's not always that because the scripture we started with said Jesus commanded them to get in the boat. He's like, no nap for you. No, no. Jesus said, get in the boat. Okay. Sorry, Jesus. You're coming to it. No, I'm getting away from y'all. <laughs> so these guys, and it says that it was like the fourth watch of the night. So it was near daybreak. They had been work, you know, they were grieving over John the Baptist. They'd been working all day at waiting tables and giving people food and then going and cleaning up after them. And then instead of getting a nap, Jesus says, get in a boat. And they're in a boat in the middle of a massive storm. So it wasn't like, hey, Peter, you stay up and watch the rest of us are going to sleep. No, it was, we all have to be awake, alert, and ready because we're facing a storm and we've all got a job to do. <laughs> have you ever been used by God and just so tired, but so full of adrenaline at the same time, you're like exhausted? Like you've got this excitement, but it's not really truly excitement because it's following with exhaustion. And I don't know which one I am, but I am it. I'm excited and I'm exhausted at the same time. And then, during the midst of the storm, Jesus shows up. And this isn't the time whenever Jesus noticed the storm and then said, peace, be still, and the storm stilled. This is the time that Jesus was asking them to be obedient in the midst of the storm. How many times in our lives do we miss what Jesus is asking us to do because there's a storm present and we're more concerned about the storm being stilled than what we are with being obedient to the voice of Christ? How many times? I'm guilty of that. It's like, surely God isn't asking me to do anything. Now, I've been, I've been working. I've been, on the, I've been doing this work. I've been doing this mission trip. I've been doing this project. I've been witnessing. I've not had an hour's sleep in forever. My family's falling apart. My job's falling apart. My relationships are falling apart. My finances are in a wreck. Surely God's going to steal all of this and then ask me to do something. Don't be surprised if Jesus shows up in the middle of the storm and asks for your obedience before the storm calms. Don't lose focus on Jesus Christ because of what's happening around you. I'm going to ask Aaron Baldwin if he will to come up. Don't worry. Unlike Kelly last week, I checked with Aaron beforehand. <laughs> Kelly, you're welcome. All right, come up here and stand by the piano for me here. So we're facing this way, and Aaron's destiny is to get over to that organ. So that is where Jesus is in your life, and he's wanting you to get over there. Go ahead. Go ahead. No tricks. Just go ahead and walk. I'm disturbed of how much trust issues we have <laughs> here. Okay. Pretty simple, right? So he got from where he was to where Jesus wanted him to go. And it was super easy. Anybody ever experienced that before? Nah, me neither. Get back over here. This is where the trust issues come from. Okay, now I'm going to, I'm going to, we're in church, yeah, I know. so you got to be honest. Okay. Can you see? Well, uh, just a hair. 
Okay. All right. Well, uh, it's got a couple layers there, so just okay. adjust it to where you can't see. Okay. I told you I was going to fall, and, and now this confirms. I'm counting on it. <laughs> Jesus loves us even when we fall. <laughs> Say law. <laughs> so anyhow, okay. Now, I would like for you to make your way to Jesus at the organ. Okay, so go ahead and go. Kevin, I apologize for whatever I do to the drum set. Okay. So. Okay, hang on just a second. Hang on, wait, wait. Come back here, come back here. This is too easy because, I mean, I don't think any of us would have, like, we could all relate to being blindfolded and not, folded and not knowing exactly where we're going. But isn't it kind of like life? That when we're trying to make our way and figure out what we're doing for Christ, that life spins us in circles with the winds and the waves and all of that stuff coming against us, right? He's counting steps. I can feel it. <laughs> all right, now find your way to Jesus. I'm pretty sure there's a piano right here somewhere. <laughs> I'm going to have to get closer so y'all can hear this. If running I take a nosedive off the front of the stage, I, I just need a little bit of you, you are insured, right? Health insurance. Okay. All right, all right. Come back here. Come back here. So, so hang on a second. So he was not headed in a good direction, right? So now life's going to throw a few more things at us. We're going to turn in circles a little bit more. I think I'd rather hit the tree on tiger. <laughs> so now we're going to give him just a little bit of help. All right. We're going to play the, the hot cold game, you know, like warmer, colder, that kind of thing. So Jody's not allowed to pull. No, no, Jody, no. There's trust issues there, too. We're learning a lot today, aren't we? <laughs> All right, so find your way to Jesus. All right, help him out, guys. That's not warmer, colder. Okay, stop right there. Church, I would like for you to see what disobedience looks like. Blatant disobedience Thank you. from your worship leader. All right, get back here. Way to ruin an illustration, Kennedy. <laughs> All right, so life is going to throw a few more things. Oh, so it's great for us to be able to come alongside of our brothers and sisters in their direction, and we need to help them to pay close attention. And it's great. They need that feedback from us, even if somebody cheats while doing it. <laughs> you know, they need that feedback from us. But the most important thing that I can say to you is do not neglect the message of the truth of the gospel. That we have a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And we have someone that will never leave us nor forsake us. And we have somebody that no matter how confusing the times get, if I start to move over, comes alongside of me and will help to redirect. We have a Holy Spirit that's been given to us that God has dwelling inside of us so that when we get near catastrophe, He can pull us back in the right direction. And this is like really what most of our relationships with God look like, isn't it? It's like, I'm heading this way. God's like, no, 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 we're going this way. Don't push me off the stage. We're going this way. But we have this internal source of guidance, God, the Holy Spirit, that can get us to the place where we're going. Go ahead and take your blindfold off. Yeah, you found Jesus. Good job, man. I want to ask the praise team if they would to come up for us. Everybody but Kennedy. <laughs> we, we need to talk after service. <laughs> Pay close attention. Do not allow the things of this life, no matter how windy, no matter how high the waves, no matter how intense the storm is, do not allow those to pull your focus off of Jesus Christ. And when things get crazy and you don't feel like you can see anything in front of you, that's the time that we even need to more cry out to Jesus. That God, this, this world has got me in a whirlwind right now. I feel like I'm in a washing machine on the spin cycle. I have no idea where I'm going. I have no direction what's right. God, I'm crying out to you and he gives us the spirit of truth that will lead us 
in the direction where he wants us going, even when we can't see the final destination that he has for us. Amen? Amen. Pray with me if you would. Father, I pray that you help us this morning to keep our focus on you, uh, that we don't drift, that we're not pulled away by the tide, the, the things that come against us, that the enemy uses, that this world uses to try to pull our attention and our focus off of you. But God, that we keep everything in our lives totally surrendered in the right priority, in the right focus, which is through and in you. Jesus, you're not a supplement to what we have going on in our lives. You are our life. And the things that we have, the things that we do, the things that we're blessed with should all serve to glorify you and speak the gospel to those around us. Father, I pray you help make this reality in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I've asked some folks to come and be available for prayer during this invitation time, and I'm going to ask them to go ahead and and come forward for us this morning. If you're here and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, if you've not surrendered your heart to Him, and you're feeling that draw, that tugging on your heart, then I encourage you to do so, to respond to His calling on your heart this morning. If you're here and you feel like you're just in this whirlwind of life, that your focus is being so torn, that the winds and the waves are crashing around you, that you don't have any direction, you feel like there's not one more thing that can happen to me. There's not one more thing that I can handle. I urge you, urge you to come and be prayed for. Let these people serve you and pray for you. If you don't want to pray with someone, come, just kneel. You can pray on your own. If that's, if that's a little much, raise your hand. Somebody will come to you, I promise you. See us after service. Do not leave here without seeking the face of the Lord for what's going on in your life. As we stand and as we sing this morning.
seated for a moment. Good morning, church. Man, what a blessing that message was. I, you know, I love those experiences like that, when, especially when Ben does those uh, things, because that just looks like my relationship wandered around, and the Lord just helped me out. So, amen. Thank you so much for that. Just so some quick announcements. Um, this Thursday, they're having a women's Bible study, and it's over in the gym. Um, it's from 7 o'clock to about 8.30 or 7 to 8 right there. If you're interested, you can please see uh, Therese Blodgett about that So on Thursdays. Um, this Thursday and Friday is going to be the food pantry. So if you're involved in that or you'd like to be involved in that, please reach out to one of the elders or somebody so you can get involved in that event. Um, last uh, announcement before I bring Thomas up, on March 5th at Gregoryville Christian Church, they're going to have a women's aspire. So it's going to be a women's ministry, and it's going to go from 5 to 8 p.m. They're going to have worship. They're going to have a Christian comedian. It's not going to be Ben, I promise you. And then they're going to, and then they're going to have uh, some of the word. So if you're interested in that, it's $25 for each ticket. So if you're interested, uh, please see Kim about that. Just get in contact with her because they need to know how many people are going to go to that event. So I'm going to call Thomas up, and he's going to uh, finish up the announcements, and then he'll close us out in prayer. Yeah, I got a couple of things uh, just regarding youth. So this is just high school, middle school. This doesn't affect kids. So kids are still meeting tonight, um, regular schedule, stuff like that. Um, youth, we were made aware, or I was made aware sort of later last night, there's a, a worship event going on at um, Bridges this evening. So we're actually going to be going to that this evening, a big worship event put on for multiple youth. Um, so we are going to be meeting here at 5 o'clock for some food and leaving at 5.30. Um, so that's for our all high school, middle school. Please do come along to that. It's basically like our normal thing, except we're not doing it here. We're just going to go to Bridges and meet with loads of other high schoolers, um, many of whom you probably already know. Um, so make sure to come along to that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Secondly, uh, this Wednesday, um, we are actually going to be taking our youth to the, uh, the stuff that's going on down at Asbury. Um, so primarily high school, that's kind of what we're focusing on. Middle schoolers, if you want to come, you're welcome to. I think it's mainly targeted for high schoolers, but obviously... We're not going to refuse anybody. Um, so, but we'd really encourage you to come along to that. Um, uh, just as Ben was talking about taking our, our faith seriously and, and putting Christ first in everything, I know there's lots of other stuff that goes on throughout the week. I know there's after school things. I know there's practices. Um, this is a really special thing that's going on. All of, a lot of our leadership have already been down there. Ben and I have been down there. There's a lot of really cool stuff going on, and the atmosphere is incredible. I'd really encourage you, if at all possible, um, do send your kids to that. We will take as many as we can. Um, down there. So that'll be, we'll be going straight after school. So as soon as school is over, uh, just come down here to the church and we'll probably leave four o'clock. Um, so just please come along to that. Uh, I think it'll be a really cool experience for a lot of our youth. So that's kind of the, the stuff that's going on. I'm going to pray. Uh, if you have any questions about those, please do come find me after service and I'll give you more information. Uh, I'm going to pray and then you guys are dismissed. Father, thank you for um, the challenge of um, living authentically for you. And Lord, there's so many distractions day to day that we face. Lord, there's going to be distractions the moment we walk out this door. Uh, but Lord, give us uh, an enthusiasm and an excitement for you that transcends everything else uh, in our lives, whether it's our family, our, our friends, our belongings, our, our public reputation, whatever it might be, Lord, you come first and really help us to, to do that in our lives day to day. Lord, thank you for this time when we get to go out into the mission field um, for the rest of the week. And Lord, I pray that you bring us all back safely next Sunday um, to be encouraged and um, uplifted again and edified as a body so that we can continue to go out into the mission field. In your name we pray. Amen.